Five minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. How many of you remember when the movie Jeepers Creepers was made here in Marion County? What year was that? Do you remember, Robin? Oh, it's at least 15 years yeah, ago, something like that. 14 or 15 years, 15 years yeah. ago. Uh, and at the time, you were with the film commission, and uh-huh. somehow you got us to audition to be extras on this film. And, and long story short, they picked the two of us to be part of a bunch of extras that were in that movie. And so if you blink, you, we are now immortal <laughs> if you blink, you miss our immortality. Yes. But but I remember the experience, and it was like we were there for three days, mm-hmm. for three days, and they took Polaroids, I think, of us in the very, very beginning, and whatever we were wearing that day, we had to wear every single day. You yep. you especially, they had your hair a certain way. Mm-hmm. They had, a, I think they had a stick through your hair, right? Did yeah. they have a stick through your hair? Yeah. And, and, and so everything had to be exactly the same. If there was a pen in your pocket, the pen had to be in your pocket, right? Exactly. Everything had to be exactly the same. And all we were was extras that would be seen in the blink of an eye. We weren't the stars. And it made me realize that when you see credits at the end of a movie that indicate who was responsible for the clothing, it's not just a matter of saying, here you go, <laughs> get dressed and go out there. I mean, there's a really a lot more work to it than I ever would have imagined just from that little tiny experience that we had some 15 years ago. Uh, Jean-Pierre Dorliac has been doing this for his life. Uh, he's an acclaimed award-winning costume designer for movies, for TV, for Broadway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even, this is coincidental, when we were doing that uh, Jeepers Creepers thing, the actress Leslie Ann Warren was there. She wasn't in the yeah. movie, but she was there. And we so were invited to her bungalow. It was one of those, yeah, it was one of those moments. Were we at her house? Yes. Oh, that was her house? Yeah, well, staying here. Oh, I didn't know that. While they were filming, that was where So it was one of our, you know how the Jer- David Letterman used to say brushes with with greatness? That yes. was one of our brushes with greatness. And Jean-Pierre Dorliac um, designed, let's see, the spandex, the purple spandex outfit with boots, uh, and then became really, really popular, I guess. Everybody wanted something like that. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Ann Warren was wearing it. <laughs> she looked great. <laughs> uh, Jean-Pierre Dorlet, good morning. Uh, oh, he's written a book called The Naked Truth, The Irreverent Chronicle of Delirious Escapades. I love that title. <laughs> Jean-Pierre Dorlet, good morning, sir. Good morning. Where are you? Uh, I'm uh, looking over a city, which, and uh, it's beautiful this morning. What city? Uh, here. Uh, it's just wonderful. And I heard you talking about Jeepers Creepers. You said Leslie Ann Warren, but I think you meant Leslie Ann Down, don't you? No. No, I think her name was Leslie Ann Warren. Yeah. I don't know. But I'm, no, 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 wait. Are you talking about the, fi- the, the horror film that Victor Salva directed? Right, yes. right. Right. Well, the cinematographer's name was Don Fauntleroy, and Don Fauntleroy is married to the beautiful, beautiful English actress who was considered for somewhere in time. And she was on location with Jeepers Creepers. They are both cl- two of my closest friends. Is that right? Yes. Wow. But Leslie Ann Warren it was in Cinderella originally on Broadway, and she's the one who I did the, the spandex outfit for for the back lot at Studio One. But Leslie Ann Down is the beautiful wife of my good friend Don Fauntleroy. And all those things you said about uh, costumes and continuity and wearing the clothes over and over again right. is exactly true. But I have to be very honest with you, <laughs> that is not my doing. I set the look, and then I have the most wonderful, gifted wardrobe people. They're called costume supervisors, key customers, and they're the ones who take care of the continuity. They're the ones that go around and say, uh, your pen is supposed to be at this angle, and your tie is supposed to be this way. Oh, okay. The last shot we took of you, your collar was just kind of outside of your suit jacket. And they're the ones, and that's called continuity. And they have to do that because if you don't, then you get a very funny movie where people's clothes change in, in position all the time. And if you watch it really close in a lot of films, you can see that because they didn't have very gifted 
costumers. And uh, that is really one of the biggest and most important things in movies is, um, is making certain that the clothes all uh, match from scene to scene. Because another thing that most people don't understand is that we don't film things in continuity. We may do a scene of someone driving to a doctor's office and getting out of a car and walking in the building, and then three days later, we may actually shoot the interior of, of the doctor's office. So the clothes that were worn in the previous scenes have to be put back on. They have to be cleaned, and then they have to be put back on again. And then there's photographs taken out, and they, everybody looks at the photographs and said, yeah, this matches, this matches, and then they send them on front of the camera. So costume designing and costuming are two different separate things, but we work hand in hand. Actually, we're even two different unions. The Costume Designers Guild is 892, and the Wardrobe Union is 705. Wow. And, and wow. We're not even, we don't even have meetings together or anything. But when I do a picture, I gather together my costumers from various other experiences, if they're available, and they're the ones who, uh, who take responsibility for making the film look so complete. So when something is a costume that looks like normal everyday clothing, that's got to be a different challenge than something like what a Star Wars movie might call for, right? Not as far as continuity goes. As far as designing goes, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, because, um, uh, well, it, it, there's a very funny story in my book when we did Battlestar Galactica, and uh, the networks uh, uh, were absolutely thrilled over how it took off. It was one of the biggest television programs there was in 1978. And, but it cost a lot because... Every single costume in Battlestar Galactica, every single costume was, was drawn, fabric was selected, accessories were selected, it was manufactured, it was put together, and they went on screen. And uh, people have asked me many times how many costumes I did. I have a stack that's about three feet high of illustrations. Uh, I would work at the studio 14 hours a day, and then I would go home and I would sketch for six hours because my deadline was so big, I had to, I had to just keep churning the things out. My I, goodness. There must have been over 2,000 costumes designed for the show. Wow. And, and they were very very, very intricate, especially the Cylons, the great big silver menacing uh, aliens that were in the film. Right, <laughs> right, right. They were designed for stuntmen who had to be seven foot tall, and they had also uh, lifts in their shoes to make them even taller, and they were working in uh, these costumes that were actually built on buckram. I don't know if anybody still knows what buckram is. I don't think I ever knew. Mm -mm. Well, it was used to. Uh, it was used for stiff men's hats many, many, many years ago, and then it was used for uh, like football shoulder pads and things like that. Oh, okay. It's um, it's a white um, open weave uh, fabric that's stiff as a board because it's been. Uh, soaked in something that's close to what like starch is. Uh, and we built all the Cylons on this and then covered them with vinyl, silver vinyl, and, and uh, silver mail and all these other intricate things. And when the, when the poor stuntmen got into the costume for the first day and put them on, th it was very difficult to walk because in the thigh part of the leg, there was no movement. It was just stiff as a board. Oh, and, man. And the, they put the helmets on, and the helmets had been de designed so that only a little triangle of pin dots were in the bridge of the helmet for the stuntman to be able to see out of. There was no peripheral vision. 
and on the first day, they somebody decided that they wanted the stuntmen to ride in on horses that were disguised oh, as an alien creature. And they got the stuntmen up on the horses, and they couldn't see. And every time they took off in a direction, they would fall off the horse. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, no. Is that stuff on film anywhere? Any outtakes? No, they finally cut the scenes out, thank God, and had them walk in. <laughs> oh, I got you. Oh, man. All right, uh, we need to take a little break, and we'll be right back. We have kept us spellbound. Uh, Jean-Pierre Dorliac on the phone. You, you said you were looking over a city. What city are you looking over? Montevideo in Uruguay. Oh, my oh. goodness. In Uruguay. I had a first call from Uruguay ever. All right, we'll, we'll take a little break. This is fun stuff. We'll be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident for today. Clouds and a few intervals of sun, along with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm. Any thunderstorm can produce large hail to high 83 to 87. Mostly cloudy tonight with a passing shower. Lows in the mid to upper 60s. For tomorrow, a shower with thunderstorm in the morning. Then some sunshine, high 82 to 86. Wednesday, partly sunny. Chance of a shower or thunderstorm along the coast. Close to high 83 to 87. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Career Source Citrus Levy Marion brings together business and community partners, economic development leaders, and educational providers to connect employers with qualified, skilled talent and job seekers with employment and career development opportunities. Tune in the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9.30 a.m. to Career Source Citrus Levy Marion and learn how they can help you. Buried under receipts and confusing tax code, let Crippen and Company help. They work hard to make the tax preparation process as painless as possible. With offices in Ocala and the Villages, their team is dedicated to helping clients with corporate and personal tax returns, bookkeeping for businesses, and estate planning for the future. Crippen and Company crafts a truly customized experience for each client's needs, all alleviating stress and creating a big picture of your overall financial health. Call 352-732-4260 or visit CrippenCPA.com to get started. Don't get caught without your daily source of senior deals. Pick up your copy of the Senior Voice newspaper. It's your source for schedule and events tailored to seniors with information you need, like a list of free events in the area. We even have Tom's Picks, a free referral for people who are looking for a company to do work for them. Tom's Picks will refer the company to you that fits your needs. And all we ask in return is that you tell them where you heard about them. For more information, call Tom's Picks, 352-804-1223 and pick up your copy of The Senior's Voice at most any business up and down the 200 corridor. Now read Ocala downtown newspaper online. All right, uh, 18 minutes after 11 o'clock, I I just went on uh, Google Maps and looked up Uruguay and (laughs) Montevideo, so I'm trying trying to figure, I didn't even know where that was. (laughs) I had to look it up. I was thinking, where is it? Uh, (laughs) All right, uh, Jean-Pierre Dorliac is on the phone. His book is called The Naked Truth. He is uh, an acclaimed award-winning costume designer for movies, Broadway, TV. He's been telling us these amazing stories about his work on burlesque. Battlestar Galactic Burlesque. Yeah. See, you should have invited me. I could have helped you with that <laughs> that part of what you do. <laughs> Rob, Robin said you wanted to talk about the, the lizards. I mean, the what do you call them? Oh, uh, I, I read that you guys are being uh, overrun with monitor lizards and they're eating the cats. How awful. <laughs> I know, it's awful. Yeah, but if you give them Cheetos, <laughs> they stay away from the cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I don't think I'll be coming to visit you in Florida because I raise uh, hybrid cats. I have a, a leopard cat and I have a, a, a jaguar cat. Now, what, you're thinking that they're the kind that are in the zoo. These aren't. They both weigh seven pounds. They're hybrid. Oh. They're wonderfully unusual and great character cats. But, you know, I wanted to also tell you that... Um, I shot in Ocala, I believe. Isn't that where Silver Springs and Rainbow Springs is? Yes. 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 We shot a film there uh, years and years ago. It was about um, MacArthur leaving the Philippines, and we used the uh, the swamps as part of the Philippines and dressed hundreds and hundreds of of um, locals in uh, 1938 clothes. Really? Or village clothes of from. Uh, 
from the Philippines that uh, we had to design. Whoa. And one day I went out after it rained <laughs> to check over the extras to make certain that they still look good for camera. And as I was turning, uh, uh, stepping down from the honey wagon, that's where uh, the big trailers that we dress everybody in, uh, I turned around and there was this eight foot alligator underneath <laughs> the wheels. <laughs> oh no. Now, wh what was the name of the movie? What was the name? Oh, I think it was called The Road Raiders. I'm not certain. Oh, I've, wow. Wow. I've done, I've done so many movies. You know, this book I wrote, um, when I, I sat down, I, what, how, how it happened is I found all these appointment books that, you know, you're supposed to write, I'm going to meet so-and-so at 3 o'clock. Well, I, at times, had pages full of appointments, and then other days I had only one or two, and so I would use the space to write down actually verbal conversations that I found out with people that I thought were really wonderful. And uh, in doing so, um, when I started putting all this stuff together, here I had all these dialogues and all these birthday cards and telegrams and theater programs and reviews, clippings and so forth. And so I put the whole thing together and thought, this tells a fascinating story. So I'll see if what will look like as a book. And I put it together and it was 900 pages long. Oh, wow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Is that you on the cover? Guys, of course, nobody was going to be that interested in what <laughs> I'd done, so I had to cut it down. But in doing so, I cut out, well, it's, the, the book is now 393 pages. So I cut out so much. Uh, when the book finally was published and printed and came, which was last week, it's now on the market. It's on Amazon.com right now, so I'm thrilled. Anyway, I'd never seen the book on paper. I'd never seen it in book form. It had always been on the computer. And I was so thrilled that I could just sort of skim through the book and pick out things that I wanted to read. And I started laughing all over again from what I'd written because I didn't even remember it was still there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so oh, is that you on the cover? <laughs> it sure is. It is sure. Oh, is. There you well, go. you know, I, I pose for a cover if I look that good naked too. <laughs> I don't look that good naked, but you 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 pull it off, and and you're on you a do. fly. You look wonderful. You're on a flying carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you you did Blue Lagoon. That didn't seem like it had much clothing in it. Oh, you have to read the book. That was something that uh, at the premiere of the show. That's exactly you're you're, you're quoting another uh, review uh, a reviewer. He said, oh, great job, lucky job for you, not much close. Well, that was the greatest compliment in the, for me because there is absolutely no scene in the movie that either one of the stars, m maybe Chris, but certainly not Brooke, ever had their clothes off. Brooke was totally clothed at all times. What you saw in the movie that looked like Brooke was a stand-in. And Brooke's mother, Terry... Um, Shields was the most wonderful woman in the world, and they would uh, get Brooke in her clothes that looked that were very diaphanous with her hair covering most of her, and we would take toupee tape, and every strand of hair was taped over her breast and everything, so you never ever saw anything of Brooke. So the fact that it was all Victorian clothes, and it was done, you know, as a shipwreck situation was really a, quite a compliment because it created an illusion of simpleness yeah and right 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 and yet everybody was always closed so could you ha do you have any john travolta stories the reason i'm asking is because he lives here yes <laughs> oh um i've met john several times he's a very nice man i knew his agent uh, manager bob lamond very well we were close friends uh and Randall Kleiser, who did Blue Lagoon, uh, did one of his first uh, uh, films, uh, Grease, with, uh, with John Travolta. And um, uh, I've never had anybody, never heard anybody say anything but very nice things about uh, working with John. Well, I'm not uh, looking for dirt. I'm looking for, for uh, costume stories. Yes. Any costume yeah. stories? No, I never really actually designed for John. Just a, a 
peripherally people around him, but not John himself. Uh, you, you must have had a good time uh, designing for Quantum Leap since that took a place over the different eras. Quantum Leap was probably the frosting and the cherry on the cake all at once, mainly because uh, Dean Stockwell was the most professional, wonderful actor to ever work with. He'd been in the business since he was a boy. Uh, he uh, did not like costume fittings because he'd been through hundreds of them. It's like my very close friend, Gene Simmons, who never wore makeup when she was not on screen because she hated makeup from all the movies oh. she had to wear makeup in. And, and uh, Dean was that way. So Dean and I had meetings, and we discussed what colors he wouldn't wear, and that was about it, because the rest of the clothes had to be very hedonistic looking, out of this world, because they were futuristic. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dean simply said, just do your thing, just don't put me in fuchsia. And <laughs> all these clothes for Dean, they would be done in the workroom, we would take them to the set, put them in his room, he would put them on, come out on the set, walk around the set, do a little fashion show and go, isn't this fabulous? <laughs> Dean, I, I cannot tell you, I, I cannot say enough wonderful things about Dean Stockwell. So, so when you design a costume, do you own the patent to it? If the, I don't even know if that's the right word. No, I own the sketch, but not the patent because the studio employs me and basically because they pay for the fabric and they pay for the labor, they own the costume afterwards. I have, Edith Head, who was my mentor, gave me excellent advice at the beginning and said, always have it in your contract that you own at least five pieces of the principal's clothing because of uh, exhibits and so forth that will come up in the future. Oh, really? If you don't have them, you certainly can't go back to the studio and get them because Usually the studio takes them and then they rent them out to other people and those people have the right to alter them, to make them shorter, tighter, whatever for the who, whoever actor is going to wear it. And sometimes they literally transform the costume entirely. I did a dress for, uh, a wedding dress for Quantum Leap that was built on a pannier, which is like, not like a hoop skirt, but it sticks out on the sides and front and, and flat in the front and back. It was worn during the 18th century by, like, Marie Antoinette and so forth. But I did this wedding dress out of it, and years later I went back to... Uh, I didn't own the dress. I, it wasn't in my contract. So I went back to the studio because somebody was doing a big wedding display and they wanted one of my dresses, and I took it out of stock. And somebody who was not educated, had looked at this dress and put it on a mannequin and went, oh my God, look, it's, it's, um, it's fallen on the side. It's longer on both sides. Well, let's just cut that off. Oh, oh. oh no. And this was an $8,000 beaded white skirt. Oh, no. Just the skirt because it had a peplum over it. And they cut it all off. And so when I went to put the dress back on the mannequin with the correct foundation underneath it, the whole hemline of the dress was entirely gone. Now the, the bottom of the dress smiled at you. It all raised up. Oh, no. Oh, oh man. You in the dress. So we that's why Edith Head's advice was very, very, very good, because uh, the studios do not take care of clothes at all. Matter of fact, there's a whole section in my book about when I was doing The Bastard and the Rebels, which was set during the Revolutionary War, and I went all over uh, Hollywood wow. to find Jean? period clothes, and I went to a, a studio and went into a warehouse, and there was thousands and thousands and thousands of period clothes hanging, and there was broken skylights above where rain had seeped through and dust had come down, and none of these costumes were covered, and they were all stained, all rotten, sagging at the shoulders. There was close to $400 million My worth of go, wow. wow. The overlooked because the studios did not want to be bothered with the cost of keeping and storing them. 
Jean Pierre, we are abs- we're out of time. That was a wonderful interview. Uh, the book is called The Naked Truth. I just found it on Amazon. Uh, if you if you buy, you'll, you'll be the first one to offer a review. Um, thank you, yes, Jean Pierre. Thank anybody who buys it, please give me a review on Amazon.com. It means a great deal to me and to the publishers. And uh, you know, I've loved having this interview with you. You guys are great. And um, if I get to Florida, just keep the lizards. Away. <laughs> we will. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of from you. Thank you, Jean Pierre. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. <laughs> Volunteers await Libyan migrant survivors of a capsized boat. Gemma Parkin of Save the Children. This isn't a humanitarian disaster. This isn't an unpredictable earthquake or some kind of disaster like that. This is absolutely predictable. We said that people would die. 700 were on that boat. It's believed only about 50 survived. The Supreme Court has thrown out a North Carolina ruling that upheld Republican-drawn electoral districts, ordering the state's high court to reconsider. They're often...